Jesus, welcome visitors and all. Share together in our worship experience. I believe we could just say amen and go home. We've received so much already through the lessons here and what we have heard this morning already. Especially, maybe I was thinking as we read those letters, maybe I should have prepared a message on forgiveness so that we can understand forgiveness better because that's what our heart's desire is concerning the boys, Lord. Lord willing that they could benefit from our forgiveness on their account. But that's not what the Lord laid on my heart. The Lord laid on my heart something else that happened this week that I feel that uh, as we look back and we see time moving on, that uh, there's a subject that somehow we as Anabaptists are maybe beginning to slip and slide on. And that's what the Lord has laid on my heart for. That's the involvement in the political systems. Um, this week, I'm sure you've seen where a new president took office and I don't know if you've seen it in the paper or on maybe some of the views or in a magazine. Time magazine's already out with it. But we see a new president taking the oath of office, swearing in of the oath. And not only the president, but there were, since the beginning of the year, there were a number of local offices that likewise at elections that um, they also went through the swearing-in ceremony to put them in to position to do what they are called to do. As we think of that, I think of the raised right hand on the left hand on the Bible or on a book representing divin divinity and swearing the oath of the commitment so help me God. Are we to be involved? Are we to endorse something like this? On the president's situation, the Bible that was used was a five inch thick Bible that has been in the family for 128 years. The word of God didn't change in those 128 years. I don't know what that all implies, but it's does say that the Word of God, God tells us the Word of God don't change, even though the presidents do. But it's not always on the Bible. I think if I remember right, President Obama, the former President Obama used the Koran that he placed his hand on, but it was a book of divinity. Again, telling us that Maybe we're seeing more and more of our Anabaptists becoming involved, either psychologically or in actuality, in the country's legal system. This morning, I'd like to remind us what the Bible says and what our forefathers said about this subject. And I, my mind goes back. I, like Paul, remember very specifically my young Christian life that I had to change and unlearn some of the things that I learned in government class when I was in high school. I'm not ashamed of that, but I'm thankful that I can put it aside and believe the word of God and to honor it and to live by it. Turn with, you me, with me to Matthew 5. We'll read some verses there in Matthew 5 concerning what Jesus said about swearing of the oath. Matthew 5, 33 to 37. There it says, Again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time that thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. 
Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, and nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. I believe we'll go and look at some of the definitions of an oath before we enter into uh, what the Word of God says. Webster says about an oath, it's a solemn affirmation or declaration made with an appeal to God for the truth of what is affirmed. The second thought that it gives, it's a careless or blasphemous use of the name of a divine being, either by way of appeal or as a profane explanation. And I think we're all familiar with that second portion there where it talks about a profane explanation. In my growing up years, I think it's one of the hardest things that I had to put aside or what I wanted to put aside in after I became a Christian, and that's the use of profanity that was very common in our homestead. Many years I worked on that, asked God's grace and strength to overcome. And I was able to do that fairly quickly, not verbally, I mean verbally, but not mentally. Satan works in that way. But it's all the same. If you think the swear word, it's just as bad as you, well, not quite as bad. It's not influencing others. But in your own life, it's just as bad if you still think it. And I had trouble with that for a long time. But I was victorious. Only to find out years later, I would say a number of years later, maybe it's got to do with becoming older. I don't know. But anyhow that thing started coming back again, not saying profanity, but thinking it when something, some misfortune happened or so forth. <clears throat> God's name is to be used in worship, not in profanity or profane exclamations. There's a central difference between the oath or affirmation even though some people insist that they are the same. <clears throat> and what we want to point out here is the fact, and, and the dictionary there gave, that it was an affirmation, a solemn affirmation or declaration. What makes it wrong for it to be an oath? The fact is that an affirmation is missing the raised hand and the appeal to God and the I do solemnly swear. <clears throat> so help me God, many times is what they say. Could the raised hand represent a commitment to the oath? Or an allegiance to it? I don't know. It's a part of the ceremony. What does it mean when they raise their hand and they give that oath? <clears throat> I don't believe it's the same thing as lifting up holy hands to God, which the Bible talks about. It has a different meaning, I'm pretty sure. I didn't check that out. I don't know how I could. But that's what they often do, always. <clears throat> In an affirmation, we simply state that we mean to tell the truth so far as we understand it, knowing that if we violate this promise, we are held under the same penalties as if we had violated an oath. <clears throat> but we're not using God's name in vain. <clears throat> One of the, um, while, our, while we positively are commanded to swear not at all, we notice Paul was not hesitant to write to Titus, I will that thou affirm. Again, pointing out even in the scriptures that the affirmation is not wrong, but that the swearing God has changed with Jesus' teaching 
in the New Testament. We notice back in Matthew 5, the first verse we read there in 33, it says, Again, you have heard that it's been said of them of old time. Or he was representing the Old Testament. And, <clears throat> and it seems like in the Old Testament, it was acceptable under certain circumstances to use the oath. As we think of, my mind went back and I searched different other places, especially the forefathers. Under the Schleichheim Confession of Faith, which was written by the Swift Brethren in 1527, it went on to say the oath is a confirmation among those who are quarreling or making promises. In the Old Testament law, it was commanded to be performed in God's name but only in truth, not falsely. And if we turn back to Hebrews 6, reading 6 and 16 and 17, verses 16 and 17, it gives a confirmation of what the Swiss brethren were talking about. I appreciated that. I like to read that. <clears throat> in Hebrews 6. Reading verses 16 and 17. There it says, For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel. Immutability means unchangeableness of his counsel confirmed by an oath. So, there it was confirmed. It was to settle strives or so forth. Appreciated that thought, but then under the Old Testament, it was the time of law. And so there needed to be something to help. Um, in the Old Testament, it was never right to use the profane oath. The Ten Commandments, if we look at that, one of them said, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Verse 7. Much profanity today involves unconsecrated speech, impure or defiled words, not just God's name in vain. And I'd like to go on a little bit further. I remember in school, in high school, there in our classes, and I'm thankful, I don't know how it is today, but I'm thankful that our teachers enforced those things. Profanity was not allowed. And if something happened, I still remember very specifically, if something happened, some of the, some of, not me, I didn't do it, but many of the other students, instead of saying S-H-I-T, which is a bad word, they would say sugar in the same context, in the same way. Was it, was it swearing? I believe it was, just using a different name that passed the test. But it was really, in context, swearing. Or something that's maybe more common to us, instead of using God's name, have you ever heard someone say, by golly, you know, is that of the same context. It's actually swearing. It's more in our language today, but it's doing the same thing. Profanity, that's what it is. Let's name it for what it is. In the Dortrich Confession of Faith of 1632, they used the terms high and low oaths. High representing the appeal to God or in the form of swearing in that way, and low to vulgar profanity. All applications of the oath is essentially the same, it being an obligation in the name of the deity or some idol with a penalty for its violation. <clears throat> in Numbers 32, uh, Numbers 30, verse 2, Scripture tells us in the Old Testament, if a man vows a vow unto the Lord or swears an oath 
to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. I think of Jephthah's vow that he made, the foolish vow Jephthah made. I think he was in sincerity making that, but we need to be careful about some of the vows and some of the promises and some of the uh, uh, oaths that we might possibly endeavor to make. But he made that vow and his, he said, he told God that if, if I win the war, he didn't really want to go and God told him to do that. And so if I win the war, I'm going to offer whatever comes, meets me at the door when I return victorious. And to his great distress, his daughter came to the door. Plagued him greatly. But I honor, as you read that story, I honor even greater things, and that's the daughter accepted what that vow was and yielded herself to it. Read the story. She was allowed two months. That was a, a question that she asked her father. She said, can I have two months to bewail my virginity? And after that, she came back. And the scripture says that he fulfilled his vow. I don't know how it all went, but he fulfilled his vow. And there was, there was a holiday, you might say, in our words today, set aside for representing what she did for and what happened through that. But he did not, Jephthah did not break his word. Deuteronomy, back in the Old Testament, tells us what that punishment is or what it consisted of. In Deuteronomy 23, 21, it says that if you break your vow or that vow, it will be sin to you. And we know what sin is. It's a separation from God. It needs to be accounted for, taken care of. Now going back again to Matthew 5, 34, the next verse there. But Jesus said, but I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, nor earth, nor by Jerusalem, or appealing to higher authority or deity. And that's what one of the scriptures pointed out, that you do when you make and swear an oath. In Hebrews 6, again, the 17 and 18 confirms on what oath does. Let's again look at that verse and read those two verses in Hebrews 17 and 18. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. It goes on talking more about what God has done for us. But it's impossible for God to lie. <clears throat> Don't swear. What about us? We are human creatures. Why was it possible for God to do it when we are not? We are not to do it. And God was able to give vows and to honor them. It's because God is God. He is omnipotent. He cannot lie. He is immutable or unchangeable as said there in Hebrews and also in Malachi 3.6. The affirmation has taken place of the oath for us Christians. And that's what we ought to be doing rather than taking the oath. Remember, it lacks the raised hand, the appealing to God. That sounds all right. But it, it's not a form of worship to God when we appeal in that, appeal in that way. And of, of um, what was the last one? Can't think of it. 
<clears throat> the Old Testament time it was a dispensation of law. People were governed by fear. There were always results that accompanied. If you stole something, you gave it back fourfold. There, was, there were penalties to curb the tendency of man to bear false witness and violence. That's what penalties does. We do that, yet those in the natural world, that still applies. And in rearing of children, many times, that's what we use, the method we use to get them to understand there's a penalty involved with something that's done wrong. If you drive down the road at 80 miles an hour, you might have a fairly large penalty to pay. But if you drive the speed limit, you don't have to worry. And what happens when God is in your heart, you will drive 55 because that's how God said, or that's how God, uh, that's a safe zone to be driving in and you're not breaking the law. So you don't need to be afraid. I still remember years ago when we came together at home. Was it Christmas, Thanksgiving, or something? And anyhow, we were talking about it. And, and of course, this was my divorced brother that said this. And anyhow, my other brother was saying how he was driving. He said he's cruised at 64. Or no, it was 55 at that time. And he said he, he said it about four miles over or five miles over. He said he's cruised so that he could get home quicker, you know. And then my divorced brother said, hmm, pre premeditated sin. Whew, that took me for a ride, but that's really what it was. You know, you, you set your mind on doing something wrong. <clears throat> it's to help us keep us in line. That's what happened in the Old Testament. But then in the new, we, we notice that the affirmation is now a product of the reign of grace and truth. And I think of the example of the woman taken in adultery. She uh, experienced, she should have been stoned. But there were some other things that Jesus seen in that situation. The man should have been there too to be stoned. But they were trying to find fault. But Jesus used that example to show us that we are in the New Testament, there's mercy and grace. And that if our hearts are made right and we're sorry for sin, that can be applied instead of law. <clears throat> when Christian people are constrained by the love of God to obey the truth from inward principles, the oath is not needed. Adam Clark puts it this way, an oath will not bind a dishonest person or a liar, and an honest man needs none, talking about the oath. And how often we see that. Those that go through court, they're asked to say the truth and nothing but the truth, but they can lie outright so vividly. It doesn't bind them. Yet an honest man, because of the condition of his heart and God being in it, we don't need an oath. That's why Jesus said, let your yea be yea and your nay nay. That's why Jesus said, let your communication be yea Yea, and nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than this cometh of evil, proceeds from an evil mind, produces an evil custom, is of an evil example, and tends to an evil end. That quote was from the British Family Bible. Honesty is a key that helps in our relationship in relation to taking the oath and not doing it. 
Truth and fidelity are essential bases on which all society is founded and without which there could be no peace, no security, no right, nor property in the world. Total honesty is everything. I think of Pilate. Communication uh, talks about the communication of thy faith. Communication is not necessarily just talking about talking. It's talking about, it speaks of at what some of our forefathers did and how they understood this subject. The position that they took. Their position often brought persecution, torment, and misunderstanding, and even death. Going back to the Schleiheim Confession of Faith of the Swiss Brethren in 1527, when they wrote it up, they quoted concerning the oaths. It says the oaths sworn in unbelief, that was interesting, and things of that kind which are highly regarded by the world and yet carried out in flat contradiction to the command of God in accordance with the unrighteousness which is in the world. Basically saying, we don't do it. A hundred years later, approximately a hundred years later, the Dorothy Confession of Faith was written up in 1632. And there, it also gave a thought concerning the oath. Regarding the swearing of oaths, we believe and confess that the Lord Jesus has dissuaded, or that means persuaded, his followers from and forbidden them the same. That is, that he commanded them to swear not at all, but that their yea be yea and their nay nay. In 1921, in Garden City, Missouri, the Mennonite faith, which is completely, it was, had different standards than it has now, but the Mennonite faith revised 18 articles of faith, revising them from the Dorothy Confession. In Article 8, it says that the swearing of oaths is forbidden in the New Testament. Again, there is still an adherence to what scripture says. I like that condensation. Where are we at today? Are we going to slip away from those points that verify the truth of God? And are we going to take up those things? This day and age, more and more, we're called to come in, to serve jury duty, to do different other things possibly. We're required to. To ignore it and stay away will cause you to be a per, uh, cause you perjury, and that will get you into prison or into jail. It'll give you a, something. We need to be honest and, and meet those things. But how are we going to respond? Are we going to honor when they ask us to take the oath? Or when you get a piece of paper that says, "Do you swear?" Can you cross it out and say, I affirm, and see if that passes? If not, we'll have to do the same that our forefathers did many years ago, maybe be brought to persecution and torment, maybe even a lot of misunderstanding, I'm sure. And I don't know what the result may be, but our world is different. But can we stand on the word of God? Jesus says, swear not at all. In closing, I'd like to make a statement here that Daniel Kaufman made out of his book, 1,000 Questions and Answers on Points of Christian Doctrine. He says there, a child of God is more solemnly impressed with the truth of God's word than with the unscriptural oath. An appeal to God is not liable to impress those who do not have enough reverence for God to obey him. Unquote. Thus, they are not afraid to be untruthful. That's why they do what they do. May we be found to reverence God's name only in a form of worship. Shall we kneel in prayer?
Gracious Heavenly Father, as we have covered this subject as you would have us to, we pray that your name might be glorified through it and help us to learn and to warn us and our people in our day that we're living in that we would stand on the principles that you have established and that we would honor thee in those things and that we would not seek the world's way of affirming our truth, but to live it out and to be an example and to yet let our yea be yea and our nay nay, that we would be a truthful people glorifying thy name. Help us to understand these things. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. <laughs>